Hello, everyone. We've got uh, one more extended session before lunchtime, and like to get going on that. Um, I'm Peter Scarf, and I work on soil and nutrients here at the university, and I'll be um, moderating the session and introducing the speakers. Uh, I've just got uh, three slides for you before uh, we get going with the main speakers. And uh, this is a picture from last year in late April, uh, right after a large, intense, heavy rainfall had happened the night before. and. Um, you can see that there's some standing water in that field and some terrain in that field, some up and down. Um, and what happened was that there was some gullies following the plant rows. The corn had been planted, it had not yet emerged, and just a little bit of disturbance that that corn planter created uh, became the path of least resistance for the water in that heavy rainfall. They followed right down the rows and uh, made gullies following each planter row. And I measured on, the, on this picture, which um, I didn't take, um, which was kind enough to be shared with me, that it's about, we know the corn inches are 30 rows wide, and from that proportionally I could get that those gullies are about a foot wide. And it's pretty consistent down all the different corn rows that there's about a 12 inch wide gully following that row. And then we happen to have a really convenient depth gauge on this. And um, that close-up picture that I just put up there, you can see some little yellow dots. Those are corn seeds. And they're planted about two inches deep, and there's about a half-inch root pegging them into the ground below, which is why they didn't wash away. So that gives us a pretty good idea of how deep those gullies were. And they're about two and a half inches deep. So you take that two and a half inches, and say that's 12 out of every 30 inches had two, in, two and a half inch deep gullies running through it. And that comes out average one inch. So when the guy tore this back up and replanted it, the whole field was an inch lower, or at least this whole area of the field was an inch lower than when it had gotten planted the first time a month before, or a couple weeks before. So we're looking at a five or six inch rainfall in one 24 hour period leading to losing a whole inch of topsoil. And this is one of the things that really motivates me personally when I'm working with and talking about cover crops is, is that uh, it takes an awful long time to make topsoil. And I did a, not a lot, but a, looked at a lot of sources to try to figure out how long does it take to replace that inch of topsoil that got lost? And uh, the estimates are all over the board and I'm sure it depends on on the parent material and the weather a lot so that really it's not just that people have different ideas but that it really takes different lengths of time in different places. I, I would be very happy to talk to someone afterwards about whether this number is wrong but the best number I could come up with reading a bunch of different sources was probably about a hundred years to get back to where that inch of topsoil was there. If we had grass or let's just say you know, a good row crop rotation with a good cover crop every winter covering it that that level of carbon would probably be potentially similar and maybe in 100 years we'd be back where we started. So if there had been a cover crop out there that had adequate mass to hold that in place, that one day it had the same impact as 100 years of putting it back. So, so my point is the speed that we can lose it at is so much faster than the speed we can replace it with. And that that is an important part of thinking about what cover crops are doing for soil. And, and it depends on where you are, but the numbers I've seen would suggest maybe uh, roughly half of our topsoil on row crop land in northern Missouri has been lost to erosion over the last 100, 150 years. And if we lose the other half, we're going to be in real trouble. So um, as part of my um, crusade to get people aware of this, I'm uh, buying this book for anyone who wants to read it. It's called Dirt, the Erosion of Civilizations, and it, um, Shabu was talking about that long view in the Dust Bowl and, and uh, ancient civilizations, the hundred dead cities, and, and, and Walter Loudermilk going around China. And a lot of that same material is in this book, and it's laid out, and it's uh, very, most of it's very readable. And uh, 
it, when you want to say what's the long-term impact uh, of, of erosion, well, looking backwards is easier than looking forwards. Uh, the U.S. Piedmont used to be the most important agricultural part of the colonies, and it's collapsed there in terms of being able to have th the topsoil's all gone. His d description of the solution isn't so good, but his description of the problem is great. And um, doing some economics with some numbers that came from Newell Kitchen and his team and some analysis that came from Brent Myers as far as total topsoil lost, uh, I came up with $110 per acre per year uh, in a corn soybean rotation. That's how much less money we make on that piece of ground right now than if we had just broken it out from its original condition and started farming it right now because the erosion has reduced our ability to produce that much. So. Uh, with that, I'd like to bring up Newell Kitchen, who will be our first speaker. Newell is a soil scientist with the Agricultural Research Service here in Columbia, and um, he'd like to share some of his views and experiences. So I would like to um, first take and um, read a notice of the meeting, and this is how it, what it says. We have scheduled a meeting to discuss cover crops. After presentations, we'll take some time for questions on the studies presented and then move to specifically address at least the following. One, what further research with cover crops in Missouri is needed, if any? Two, should new extension materials be generated on cover crops? Three, would workshops for farmers, extension staff, etc., be valuable? Four, are there opportunities for collaboration among ourselves or regionally? It seems clear that the demand for cover crop information has been increasing rapidly, not only in Missouri, but elsewhere. Since none of us are focused primarily on cover crops, it might be helpful to pool our experiences and ideas to see what is needed and what can be done. So uh, as I read you this notice of the meeting, I, I think many of you would hopefully have thought, oh yeah, that was that uh, the first glance, that was the announcement of our meeting here. But in fact, that was the announcement of the uh, meeting that we had 21 years ago this week here at the University of Missouri. Um, interestingly enough, Rob was fairly instrumental in helping get that group together in a room. Uh, I think maybe 10 or 12 got into the room, maybe at most, okay. There's a few of you in the room, Tim, you were at that meeting, right? There may be a few of the others here that were in that meeting. Um, so the question is, same purpose, uh, similar questions, similar type of audience. Have we made any progress in the 21 years, or, or maybe even the better question is, um, what have we accomplished or what, have we, what can we say about the last 21 years? Uh, and um, those questions are still the same. And so we might ask ourselves, really, have we made any progress? And there are perhaps a couple different ways we may look at some metrics. First, I think by virtue of the fact that we have 140 or something like that here in the room or will be with us today, that in itself, I think, suggests that there is a, a, a great increase in the interest on in cover crops. Um, if you were to compare the number of research projects, demonstration projects, um, and uh, educational, t and, and, and some of the, the materials that have come out, I think that that would be a metric that would suggest that there has been a tick up, certainly from what it was in the early 90s. Um, why? why? Why have we maybe then why is there this reinforced, renewed interest in cover crops? And that's the lead that I wanted to, or the, the statement I wanted to make relative to my message here, and it really ties nicely with what Peter just said, and that is, I think that we have been able to step back and look at things in a much more big picture, long-term way. We use this word sustainability or sustainable systems. And from the early 90s, 21 years ago, I, I, we probably used that word a little bit, but we probably did the principles and the understanding of what sustainability meant. I think we're just kind of in the incubation stage, and I think we've come a long ways from that. And the research that we are doing uh, as a part of the, 
the Cropping Systems and Water Quality Research Unit that I'm a part of is hopefully helping to develop some of those principles and practices of sustainability that look at things in the long term because that's really one of the missions and the intents of, the, of an ARS uh, unit is they look at things and they stick with things for a long period of time as a part of looking at those, those differences. I think this will work. I'll go with this. So the research area that we have done a lot of this on is up in near Centralia. It's about 25 miles to the northeast of here. Uh, we call it our Centralia Field Research Station. You can see uh, there's some uh, plots, some large plots, and then there's a, a large field there adjacent to it. And both of those areas are significant for our research that we have included cover crops as a part of that in some way uh, over the last uh, 20 years. Let me tell you a little bit about the plot research first. These are large plots about uh, 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 almost an acre in size each. It's a replicated study, so it allows us to look at some things uh, on a fairly large uh, basis, similar, using similar equipment that a farmer would use. Uh, we have uh, three cropping systems that have been fairly continuous over the tw 20 plus years on those plots. One that's a mulch till cropping system, corn, soybean. One that's a no-till corn, soybean cropping system. And then one that has had no-till cover crops. A few more details about that cover crop system. Well, first off, let me back up. There, there's, there's multiple aspects of what we're looking at. Grain production, uh, root zone water quality, at least early on, surface runoff, uh, water quality, uh, soil quality measurements itself. And I'm just going to hit a couple of the things that have come out of that, this plot research that, that kind of help us to understand what impact uh, cover crop has. Um, so a little bit more about the cover cropping or the, uh, the cropping system that includes cover crops. Uh, for the first 10, 12 years, we had um, a cover crop only after the wheat phase of a corn swimming wheat rotation. And we, and we used a different uh, cover crop, and it was either hairy vetch, red clover, cereal rye, and one year we used annual rye. So, uh, and I, hopefully we're all on the same page. With, um, that's annual rye grass. Keep everybody calibrated here from our morning discussion. <clears throat> so um, then in uh, 2004, uh, we made some switches and we actually include cover crop as a part of each grain season. So there's a cover crop after corn, soybean, and wheat with cereal rye, um, uh, primarily after corn and soybean and red clover or a mix of legumes, uh, brassicas, and grass after wheat. And, um, so here's a, a couple of quick slides of some of the things we found there. Certainly, as you, um, and I'll point on to this one over here. So this is the corn, uh, soybean, either the till or the no-till system here. And we're looking at aggregate stability. And then this is the, the cropping system with a cover crop, a crop included. And this was actually data from about five or six years ago. And you can see there's about a 50 to 80% increase in aggregate stability. And that's very important from the standpoint of of helping to keep that soil in place when that energy coming from a rainfall, uh, you know, is, is, um, uh, is you're able to deal with that in a way to keep that, that soil in place. Uh, <clears throat> another one is looking at infiltration. In this case, we have uh, no-till, uh, the cropping system, the infiltration of it over time is considerably less than either the no-till with the cover crop or the mulch-till. Obviously, when you till a field, there's some initial uh, aeration and poor generation that you're getting to where you actually can actually get a better infiltration, but this is on a very short period of time here over the three to five hours. As that goes out over time, there's more separation between that no-till cover crop system and the mulch-till cropping system, so infiltration. The other one I'll look at is the soil quality index. Dr. Kramer, who's going to be talking a little bit more later, will, and this is actually taking um, an the, the approach is that you're taking a whole bunch of different measurements that have something to say about soil quality and you can bring them together in an index. And I'm just going to quickly show you one data slide here. If you compare the mulch till cropping system with the no-till with the cover crop and there's the index is very different on those, crop, on those plots up there at the site today than it is if you stayed with a, a mulch tilled system. So really good indicators that you have a very different thing that's taken place. If we'd have done cover crops for just two or three years and taken these measurements, 
and walked away or, and, and said, okay, this is the effect, we would have probably had a difficult time saying that there was any difference. It's the fact that there's been an investment over a long period of time, 20 years, to be able to start to see these, the effects actually take place. <clears throat> uh, one slide here, the, uh, the uh, last year or two we have renewed our efforts in being able to do a better job of looking at water quality, both in terms of the dissolve analytes as well as looking at sediment loss off of these cropping systems on these plots. And so you can see, um, we've, these show some of the new uh, uh, weirs and the samplers there. And, uh, and these are online now. We're getting them just a few more bugs we're working out of, but it'll be year-round sampling of the water quality off of these plots. <clears throat> now let's focus on the field. And I just a couple of summary slides here. You can see that the, um, uh, how this field was managed from 1991 to 2003 uh, was as a corn soybean mulch till system. It was managed in a very uniform fashion and um, during that time period we, there were significant water quality issues that were brought to light as a result of, of that management practice that was very standard or very uh, typical of other uh, practices out there in that area of the, of the country. Uh, back up. So then in 2004 to the present we changed that to a soybean wheat, uh, a soybean corn cropping system including both no-till and the cover crops. There's a quick uh, slide showing some of the, the cover crops that we've used. Five minutes? Okay. Um, on that and again those cover crops are being used uh, after each grain crop um, uh, both the soybean and the and the corn phase and of course the wheat in itself acts as a cover crop. <coughs> Uh, there's just a quick slide showing the mix that we've been using, uh, maybe a little on the high end relative to um, what Charlie, uh, I guess it wasn't Charlie, who was it that said the, the $20? That was rich. Um, you know, a little bit higher than that, but uh, we, uh, we've really liked the idea of a, a mix for these uh, um, um, cover crops, particularly after the wheat. Um, it, it tends to, depending on the climate that you have, in a year you get a little bit different uh, uh, suitability for the different uh, species you have in that mix and, and it kind of helps to compensate. <clears throat> two, uh, two slides that we put, put together, uh, Claire I think, I, is she in the room? I thought I see, had seen her. She, okay, she, she's a hydrologist on our unit. She's helped me kind of put some slides together here. So the first slide I want you to focus on here is, uh, this is the red line is the runoff off of this field relative to uh, the runoff um, or the precipitation but normalized uh, to the same time period of the whole watershed that this field is within, the Goodwater Creek watershed. So you can see it's running about uh, 70 to 80 percent of, of, of uh, less than what it is at the watershed. But the reason why you do this is because it's one field and you're looking at two different periods of time and it's the best way to kind of get a good handle on it does this new cropping system with the cover crop really have an effect and the thing that we have found with this and the blue line is then since 2004 and you can see then that the there's been approximately a 20 to 30 percent reduction and that is significant there's the statistics behind this in runoff during the six first this first six months of the calendar year so that's taking all of those last 10 years and comparing that to the previous 14 years. So runoff is reduced and it kind of makes sense because your cover crop is going to be there over the winter and growing some in the spring and you're going to get some dewatering and it really does re uh, affect that in a way to where you see a reduction in the, uh, the runoff on the field as a result of that. <clears throat> the next is looking at the sediment loss. And so now this is the sediment loss with the blue being the field and the red being the Goodwater Creek watershed on tons per acre per year. And you can see that at the field level we're quite a bit more than what we are at the watershed level. But this is before the cover crop. So what happens when you go to the cover crop? So since 2004 you can see it's actually considerably less. And in fact the, the amount of sediment loss per acre at the watershed has actually gone up. So in comparison you've had it was th at the field level we were 350% more of sediment loss than at the watershed 
in the last 10 years, approximately, we've been 32% of, of what's been going on at the watershed. Another way of looking at this is just to compare this to this. That's about, about an 80% reduction in sediment loss um, at that field as a result of shifting to this new cropping system that is no-till with the cover crops. And the cover crops are an instrument, big part of making that happen. How does that compare to others, what they've done at a plot level? It's pretty, pretty, oh, I, this is an important thing. Peter just mentioned a little bit about soil loss and how quickly are you going to get that back. And I went into the literature too, pulled out some numbers, and that rectangle that I just put up here is about the rate of soil formation. If you want to look at it in terms of loss versus gain of soil formation. So this is what we need to be at so that we're at least not losing our soil at a higher rate than what we may be forming as soil down in this area here. And so you can see with this new cropping system, we're down in that range now. We were not that, that level prior to this uh, change to this cropping system. 80% is what I just mentioned a minute ago. You can see that uh, uh, there's other studies that have been done with cover crops that show 80 to 90% 80 to reduction in sediment loss. So at the field scale, we're seeing a similar type of number that what we, you would, others have found at a plot scale. So that's kind of an important uh, kind of triangulation on that principle. I'm going to, I, I <laughs> PowerPoint is restarting. That's, he just did something to my entire, there's one way to get you off the stage quickly here. So, I, no, I think, I think that's fine. That was the main part of my message, I think. So, um, I guess I come back to the idea that, um, you know, the difference between 21 years ago and today is in large measure, I think that we recognize that cover crops are allowing us to go at things in a more sustainable way. It gives us a bigger picture of what agriculture is on our landscape and, and some of the things that we want to see as a part of a, a, a soil management package. Uh, and, um, and certainly what work we have done in the Centralia area um, over the last uh, 20 years suggests that cover crops really do help to um, uh, support that uh, hope of having more sustainable agriculture into the future. So, Thank you very much, Noel. If you can just take a seat next to me. Um, we're going to have a panel when the three speakers on soils are finished, so we'll have about 15 minutes before lunch to take care of that. And so we'll hold questions until then. Uh, I'd like to introduce next up Ranji Thudawada, who's an associate professor here at the University of Missouri in soil, environmental, and atmospheric sciences. Thank you, Peter, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Ranji Thudawada. And as you see on the left side, you will notice uh, about four or five pictures because I am working at the Center for Agroforestry. Uh, you know agroforestry is riparian buffers, various types of buffers. So I will come to that also during my talk. So this is a partnership st uh, study located in Chariton County, Missouri. Uh, there are so many scientists from MU, USDARS, NRCS, the Missouri Department of Natural Resources, Chariton County Soil Water Conservation District, the Associated Electric provided the land, 129 acres, for the study, and Missouri Department of Conservation is helping us to put up different types of buffers. Uh, seeds are provided by Cover Crop Solution, Gast, and Pioneer landowners, farmers, and private businesses are involved with this study. I like to thank everybody that supported this study. Uh, the main problem is, as you know, in the US EPA 2013 report says about 44% of the rivers. 64% of the lakes and 30% of the estuaries are impacted by water quality, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment. When you look at uh, the pictures on the slide, agriculture has been identified as the main source for water quality degradation. And the, this result shows a seven-year study, the picture has gone up and down, uh, seven-year study conducted at the Greenlee Center Three adjacent watersheds located at the Greenleaf Farm. We did a study for seven years. What it shows is about 48% of the phosphorus and 57% of the nitrogen is lost during the crop-free period. That is, 
between the harvest of the cash crop and planting of the main cash crop. So basically what it is called the brown period, brown period about six to eight months. You can plant the crop but it will take time to have a good cover and when you harvest the crop before you harvest that ground cover is already lost. It's about six to eight month period. It's called the brown period. That's the period you lose about 50% of the nitrogen and 57% of the phosphorus uh, at the green lysenter based on corn soybean rotation. And this figure shows from 1970s to 2020 plant nutrient supply by different sources, soil, manure and fertilizer. As you see there, supply by soil has gone down as well as uh, supply by fertilizers have gone up. So this leads to the study to understand how cover crops can be used to reduce sediment, nitrogen and phosphorus loss from corn soybean rotation. So we initiated study in Chariton County, it's a 129 acre farm. Uh, the area is about receiving 986 millimeters of rain. Uh, the northern part of the site, we have different cover crop combinations on these three soils. This triangular area, we are going to use as a control. That means there is no cover crop. We plant corn soybean and look at sediment loss, nitrogen and phosphorus loss, as well as several other chemical parameters, biological parameters and economics from the farm. On this area, we have six watersheds identified, instrumented with the water sampling units, monitoring units, weather stations to understand uh, nutrient losses. We installed uh, flumes, water samplers on each of these watershed. This shows the flume approach section and two berms are built. Uh, in each of these watershed, we have a water sampling unit that consists of a water sampler, flow measuring device, and maybe twice, uh, twice a month, we go to the field with a laptop and download all the data. So that way we know the weather, the, how much runoff is generated on each watershed and when it is generated, when it is stopped, and how many water samples have been collected. The lower two figures show uh, after a rain event, sediment accumulation. The left side is the one on the cover crop field. As you see, there is no sediment on the flume bed. This is from the control watershed where you don't have a cover crop. Uh, we had to clean the flume bed after every rainfall event on each of these control watersheds. As you see here, there was about four inches of sediment from the control watershed. And whereas there is no sediment on the flume bed of the cover crop watershed. This shows the numbers from that watershed. We initiated the study last year, 2013. Everything was installed in June. The first figure shows the runoff volumes. This is the average of six watersheds for the cover crop. This is the control. As you see here, about 400 cubic meters of runoff from the cover crop watershed as compared to 900 cubic meters of runoff from the control watersheds where we don't have cover crops. And the sediment loss, Newell also, Newell Kitchen, the previous speaker also showed similar results. Close to about 4.5 tons of sediment per hectare is lost from the control watershed as compared to 150 kilograms of sediment from the cover crop watershed. Nitrogen phosphorus also had similar results. About five times more nitrogen, six times more phosphorus is lost from the control watersheds as compared to cover crop watershed. Uh, the cover crop combinations we have on these watersheds include hairy wedge, turnip, radish, Austrian peas, cereal rye, and winter wheat. So some watersheds have two combinations, some watersheds have five or six combinations. That's why we have eight different watersheds with two replications. Uh, as you see, as you, I showed you on the previous slide, during the brown period, we lost most of the nutrient sediment from the watersheds. So this is a mechanism that can stop nutrient sediment loss from the watersheds. We are working on the riparian systems and buffers. That could be the final defense mechanism to protect the stream water. 
So you can stop everything coming from the watershed using cover crops, whereas uh, we, you need buffers and riparian systems that is included in agroforestry, stop everything getting into the stream. That's why we need to have a combination of managements if you are going to stop or reduce nutrient sediment losses from each of these watersheds. And uh, this is with the help of uh, Soil Health Lab. We also collected uh, 228 soil cores from, the, from this area, and we'll be collecting more soil cores from the control area. We are studying nutrient accumulator, accumulation, soil physical changes, soil microbiological changes on these watersheds as impacted by cover crops. Uh, doc, Dr. Rob Kramer, Bob Kramer and Jamie Sweka are going to study soil microbiological properties, and Marcelo uh, Anderson, Shibu Jos, and I am going to study soil physical and other changes on these watersheds to understand what are the environmental and soil changes on these watersheds as impacted by cover crops. Uh, Dr. David Hammer just uh, came to the room. He's uh, working on this uh, soil course to understand changes in uh, uh, physical properties. And Dr. Kramer's project is going to look at microbiological changes because we, are, we basically know already some physical changes have happened because if you look at the turnip or radish plant, it generates about 18, 20 inches long radish and four to five inches wide turning. So around that area, all the soil physical properties are changed. That means hydraulic properties, bulk density, uh, infiltration, water retention, and all the parameters. So we are going to study other chemical properties and microbiological properties. Then uh, I am not an expert on biofumigants since my topic is about, uh, about uh, environmental benefits. I looked at this studies because if you plant brassica family crops, they will generate biofumigants. Those are much uh, acceptable compared to chemical fumigants. What happens is when the cell is broken, uh, isothiocyanate is released. That can affect on diseases, insects, nematodes, and weeds. So what we have to do is generate more biomass, then break the cells and mix into the soil. That helps to reduce the weeds, diseases, insect pests, and nematodes. So this slide also shows other benefits. Look at the nem uh, nematode counts. Control, water, uh, control treatment had much more count compared to the mustard or oilseed radish treatment. And it also increased beneficial microorganism. Not only reducing the harmful, it also helps increase beneficial. That's another environmental benefit. Uh, there's indirect benefit because we are not using chemicals in the field, reducing the amount of chemicals adding to the water. And also that will help uh, global warming because we are not using synthetic products, carbon footprint is smaller. And below ground, cover crops also help increase carbon accumulation. As I explained to you, uh, this is from the Chariton farm, turnip and radish. The radish was about 18 inches long, that was in October. So amount of carbon added to the soil and how deep does it go and different forms of carbon. And we are planning to do several uh, five major projects with once we collect the data, we will be using topography, soils, yield, measured data, everything to understand long term effects of cover crops on water quality. And the next step. I am currently monitoring uh, several small-scale watersheds, first-order watersheds in Missouri, Northeast. They will be combined to understand long-term effect on large mixed management watersheds. And all, all the information will be connected, bring, brought to the campus, and we are putting uh, websites developed to how to decide the management, what type of cover crops should be selected, when to plant, and how to plant and when to harvest. Uh, thank you very much. Have you, do you have any questions? Um, we do have time uh, for a question for Ranjit right now while Bob is coming up. If um, anyone has one they'd like to ask before we get the panel, you'll certainly have an opportunity later as well. Okay, thank you, Ranjith, and can you please um, take a seat on the piano? <clears throat>
Next up is Bob Kramer. Bob is a soil microbiologist with our agricultural research group here in Columbia. Okay, th <clears throat> thanks, Peter. Uh, I'd like to uh, acknowledge my uh, co-author, Kristen Veeam, who's our uh, <clears throat> ARS postdoc. She's been with us for about 18 months and has really gotten into the soil uh, health uh, project that we've been ongoing for several years now. Um, let's see. Also, uh, I'd like to acknowledge that th this has been a real team effort in getting uh, much of the soil health information out, especially from the standpoint of looking at microbial diversity and uh, the microbi microbiological component of the soil health. We have uh, our uh, soil health lab established at the university now. We're, we're able to uh, uh, determine different microbial groups that are affected by management practices that help us assess soil health. Also, NRCS has been a real firm partner in this as well, and you can see all the other different components that we've been involved with. I'm sure I've missed a few people, and for that, uh, uh, excuse me for that. Okay, so what we're gonna do is uh, try to do a, in a thumbnail in the next few minutes, um, relate what's going on with cover crops on the surface of the soil with the dynamics in the subsurface. In other words, the, the, not only the, the biological activity, although that seems to be most uh, discussed in relationship to soil health, but also plant roots, the, the macrofauna, the, the insects on the soil, uh, as, as well as the other chemical and physical properties of soil. <clears throat> and when we think about uh, including cover crops or any other living crops, uh, plants in the soil, we realize that that dynamic, the biological properties in soil, is very much affected by growing plants. And if there were two properties that we wanted to talk about <clears throat> in relationship to describing soil health, the key ones would be the soil microbial diversity in the soil, the, the, the various uh, groups that are involved interacting with each other in the soil and with the plant roots, and also the soil organic matter or soil carbon, and not just the amount, but also the quality of that soil carbon, because over the last several years, we have begun to understand that there is more to soil organic matter <coughs> than just <coughs> the, uh, the number you get from the soil test lab. There, there are many fractions that we understand that contribute to soil health and uh, microbial uh, activity. So biodiversity is probably the most important property of any e ecosystem. Thank you. Uh, and, it, and the reason it's important is because it provides the numerous pathways that these organisms mediate in, in soil or in, in any environment for that matter. And probably the, one of the most important uh, aspects is the fact that many of these processes require more than just one type of organism. It, it takes a consortia. One organism cannot mediate an entire nit uh, nitrogen cycling process. So this is why it's real important to keep this diversity up and to use management practices that will promote that diversity in biological activity. Uh, this is an example of the what we would call the structural diversity in soil, the different groups of microbes. Uh, take that a little bit further. Um, we understand that the structure is one component, but probably just as important, or if not more important, is the functional diversity of these organisms in the soil that contribute to soil health. And these are influenced by plant roots. It's been reported that anywhere from 20 to 60 percent of the carbon dioxide that is fixed through photosynthesis by a plant can be deposited through the roots into the soil by a process called rhizodeposition. This is immediate carbon and energy sources for the soil microorganisms living in the soil and it is what sustains these organisms in the soil around the plant roots. And then that in turn contributes to all these different processes going on in the rhizosphere. And I've got one circled here primarily looking at the, you know, suppression of plant pathogens. If you have a very diverse com, uh, community, you have those antagonists that will keep the, uh, the uh, pathogens in check. Uh, also, the, the uh, release of a lot of phytohormones, or as we would call them, plant hormones or plant growth regulators that are produced by a lot of the microorganisms that enhance plant growth, uh, root length, and, and root uh, density. Uh, many of the nutrients are made available by microbes. Manganese is a major micronutrient, major micro, that's the kind of oxymoron, but, 
But that one is almost all the transformations are mediated by microorganisms. You've got to have manganese oxidizers and manganese reducers. And um, I'll let that slide go and you can review at your uh, leisure when you get the file. Uh, but let's not forget that, and as Peter mentioned earlier, that the soil uh, originally here before European settlement was being developed by the massive root systems that were provided by, in this situation, the prairie ecosystem. All of the dark soils that we see are a result of the, of the thousands of years of organic matter deposition in the soil that were provided by the permanent vegetation of these roots. So we can only hope that cover cropping can, can uh, provide at least a, a small proportion of this and start restoring some of these soils that have been de degraded through intensive cultivation. So the ideal functional diversity in healthy soils provided by the diverse microbes. And this is uh, another example of just uh, following, tracking carbon dioxide into the soil microorganisms that use some of it for their own development in their community and populations, releasing carbon dioxide, releasing nutrients for the plant, and then restoring soil organic matter from the carbon that is being inputted in that manner. So how does cover crops work into the maintenance of soil organic matter? Now one of our renowned scientists from the University of Missouri had stated 65 years ago that the soil, may be, soil organic matter may be considered our most important national resource. And of course that was in the aftermath of the Dust Bowl in the 30s. Living cover crops can provide carbon and nutrients to the rhizosphere microorganisms and you can and in fact, it may be doing a better job than many of the cash crops that we plant in between cover crops if that is integrated into the system. Further, the uh, cover crop residues continue to restore soil uh, organic matter by building uh, mi microbial biomass, improving soil aggregate uh, structure uh, even after they are terminated. So let's take a look at some of these soil organic components. This is a way to, to view it rather than looking at the old soil science lab where we did folic acid and humic acid. This is looking at it from a physical fractionation standpoint where we understand that organic matter in the soil consists of obviously the fresh residues and then there is an active uh, component, which we call active carbon. This is what's supporting the microbial activity and also uh, the microbes are working on that material that from fragmentation on through the metabolic pot processes to really release these nutrients. This fraction is probably the more descriptive form of organic matter that is contributing to the overall soil health. And then that portion that does contribute to the more stable soil organic matter that continues to persist in soil uh, through the years. Also notice that living organisms make up maybe 5%. It may seem insignificant that it's 5% of, say, a, a percentage of the organic matter in the soil, but if you think about it and you calculate this out on about an acre furrow slice, you would have enough biomass that may be equivalent to a, a mature cow. So if you're a true steward of your soil, you should be considering that you're not only feeding the livestock on the soil, but also you've got some livestock within the soil, about a cow per acre. Okay, now if you look at organic matter, um, the reason why the total soil organic matter is a little difficult to relate to soil health is because it does take time for it to build up over time. This is a study that we've been looking at on farm in Sheraton County on a site in the pecan agroforestry system that has had cura clover as a perennial cover for actually since uh, the, the late 90s. This is a, a 10 years of that study. And you, as you can see, organic matter did increase over time, maybe about a percent or a percent and a half. And it did a much better job than, the, than an adjacent fescue site, which was considerably lower, and obviously a continuously tilled site that may try, primarily was stabilized. So let's take a look at the active fraction, uh, what, we re, what we mentioned previously, because this may be more sensitive than the total organic matter, and, and we're proposing this as a soil quality indicator for some of the models that we're looking at. Here's a study from uh, another uh, uh, agroforestry 
uh, site in northeast Missouri, and, and as you can see, the, the more permanent uh, vegetation provides considerably more active carbon fraction than the row crop. I can't get into how this is analyzed. I really don't have the time right now. But, and the other, the other uh, situation you should understand, there's not a whole lot of work with cover crops per se on soil health, so we have to rely on some of these uh, sites where we have more permanent vegetation and make a relationship until we get that information gathered. So what is so soil health? Well, this is the capacity of the soil to function as a vital living system and promotes um, animal growth and environmental quality. Now, you must realize it's a site-specific. We can only look at this on a, on a per landscape unit uh, or landscape, and it's based on the, the management that, that is imposed on that landscape. It would be erroneous to compare a mollusol with an oxisol. And I think this is where some of the critics of soil health get, get confused. We're not looking at inherent soil quality. Obviously, a mollusol or a high organic soil is going to be a lot better productivity-wise than, than, than something like uh, and, and ultra soil that has everything washed out of it is very oxidized. We don't do that, so you have to keep this in perspective. Now, soil health is a very comprehensive assessment based on the sensitive indicators representing all soil pro properties. It's not just limited to the biological factors. And I've listed factors or parameters for each of the uh, processes of soil, chemical, physical, and biological. Those that are asterisks are those that are, have been most studied and are used in models to come up with soil indices, soil in, uh, health indices. And I'm not going to explain every one of these, but this just gives you an idea of some of the properties that are being measured and co considered in the perspective of soil health. So if you look at microbial diversity, uh, one of the ways that we can do this is to, is to use a, pr a particular analysis to come up with a fingerprint based on the cellular structure of phospholipid fatty acids in, in the soil microorganisms and then relate these to, to different groups of organisms. As you can see here, those sites with more permanent vegetation had higher uh, percentage, proportion of the groups uh, due to the, to the, the root uh, density in the soil. I'd like to particularly point out the mycorrhizae here. This was uh, brought up a little bit earlier. Uh, the permanent vegetation promotes microbial or mycorrhizae uh, uh, component in the soil health. And as you know, mycorrhizae form the symbiotic association with roots, with 90% of, of the land plants. And uh, this has become a very interesting marker uh, because it is a very versatile organism. It not only uh, provides phosphorus and uh, extends the root system of the plants into the soil to, to contact remote organic sources. It also is bringing up water, uh, not only phosphorus, but also mineralizing nitrogen and sulfur from these organic sources, taking it back to the, to the plant. It also uh, provides perfect, per, uh, protection for the plant. It also has the ability to solubilize inorganic phosphorus and uh, sulfur. So it's a very important uh, microbial component, and it's a key marker that we're looking at. In fact, looking at cover crop, uh, there are reports in uh, South Dakota where uh, different cover crops were looked at and then they looked for the uh, mycorrhizae marker. This is a result of a five-way mix of cover crops, um, wheat, clover, vetch, turnip, radish, and it uh, enhanced the populations or the numbers of uh, mycorrhizae that, that, were that were specific to a number of crops, not just the ones that were planted there. And it's interesting to note that two of, two of the uh, crops in this particular mix are brassicas, which do not host mycorrhizae, and which can produce these isothiocyanates that you've heard about previously. But in that mix, there, there apparently is something else that is going on that we really don't know, whether it's antagonizing other uh, organisms that would uh, be detrimental to the mycorrhizae, or if there are signals that stimulate the, the growth of these. But uh, this is an indication where the right mix can help uh, promote the, uh, a particular component in the soil. Uh, I'm going to go real quick here. That we've looked at some cover crops just to with, combine with weed suppression and soil health effects. Uh, this is oats in, interseeded in corn. Uh, root biomass is considerably more uh, true. Uh, something with the winter annuals is, is provides cover, we'll grant you that, but if you look at the root biomass, it's considerably different here compared to the weeds. Uh, also, 
these cover crops, uh, just spring oats or brassicas, will increase soil aggregate stability over time, also increase microbial activity over time as measured by an enzyme activity compared to just the weeds themselves. So that's a very multiplicity effect on uh, soil health. Um, plant uh, possible potential pathogens can be tested. This is some work from Iowa that is showing that if you can see the necrotic root of this corn seedling that was planted into rye, there's a possibility that that management may need to be adjusted because there's some promotion of pathogens if you seed too quickly into rye after killing it with Roundup. Okay, so finally, uh, this is an idea of some of the soil health that uh, Newell mentioned. This is on s several systems in the, in the Mark Twain drainage system of northeast Missouri, and I just want to point out that indeed when we find on-farm cover cropping here with uh, triticale and several legumes and turnips gave us the higher rating indexes than many of the other sites here that we sampled throughout that watershed. Okay, so with that, I will uh, turn it over to Peter. Thank you very much, Bob. <clears throat> and now is your opportunity, if you had any uh, thoughts, to ask the panel about their presentations or any other ideas or questions you have about soils and cover crops. So I'm imagining that we're going to have the same format as we've had for other questions with Bob. Do you got, Bob has a microphone. Is there another one in the room Can't, has one over there? So raise your hand if you would like to ask the panel something or bring up a point to discuss. Can any of you guys comment, I guess this is the right group to ask this of, on uh, how to handle um, allelopathic effects of cereal rye in a, in a corn soybean rotation? <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that you just need to kill it soon enough um, and at least two weeks before you're going to plant. But I killed four weeks before planting this year and, and uh, there was still something going on where the rye caused yield losses in our corn and beans. That's uh, the, the point of that last slide that I showed the uh, seedling. That was one of the problems that they were seeing when they did um, plant corn after rye. And there they were thinking that it was not only the allelopathy, but depends on how you're killing that rye uh, for, um, for the mulch. In this case, they were looking at Roundup was, was one factor, but the uh, rye itself also had a, a, a fact, uh, had an effect on uh, seedling growth. But, um, you know, I agree with Peter. It's, there's, a, there's a delay that has to be uh, uh, used before planting into it. That's such an important question that if you guys don't have something to say, I'm going to ask well, if I, anyone else in the room knows well, anything. I, at, at break, we were visiting with, with Mike, who's going to be our lunch speaker, and uh, he had indicated his master's research, or his PA, or maybe all of his graduate studies actually was in allelopathy, and he, he probably has a lot of thoughts with regards to that question. I know that our own experience, and if you look in the literature, that the that allelopathic effect <clears throat> seems to be really um, accentuated in the rule of thumb two to three weeks doesn't work when you have you know poorly drained soils that stay cool and that is fairly descriptive of the clay pan soils so if you're doing your re work on clay pan soils um, I, my thinking is really maybe uh, cereal rye is not a very good cover crop prior to corn it's great for soybeans Mike, do you have anything to add to that? If you do, grab the, Kent's bringing you a microphone. Yeah, we've been doing that cereal rye in front of corn for years. Um, the issue, you're correct. The, the soil moisture condition is what causes you more trouble than anything else. Um, and, and you can, you got it. you must improve the drainage on that clay pan soil with a different cover crop to get more internal perk in the spring if you possibly can. And we almost always plant our corn into, into actually actively growing cereal rye to help dry the soil out so we don't get the waterlogged conditions. I mean, that's typical, that's our normal management. Um, and we also recommend a minimum of 50 pounds of nitrogen at planting time. And we prefer to have an additional eight pounds in furrow with the seed to try and compensate for the wet, cold conditions. And uh, a lot of our producers are delaying their corn planting until May in order to avoid those wetter, colder conditions when they're planting corn into cereal rye. 
So they're adapting their system to it, and they're getting the yield increases because they're what, when they wait. Thank you, Mike. Nadia? Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to know if there are any studies or if you, I'm sure that they are, but uh, if you have some uh, information about studies done with uh, prairie plants, you, uh, to the two of you show some of the prairie plants, and if there are, or if there are any other perennial crops that are used as cover crops. I don't know if you understand understood my question. Well, you mean in, ter in terms of uh, soil health assessment? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we, we've, d we've uh, worked a little bit of that with uh, Prairie Fork and Tucker Prairie. And, um, you know, the, th the thing of it is with the prairie is, is that often we use that as a reference um, uh, site con to compare with some of our tilled soils. Sometimes that, that's, that's good, it's, 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 it's a con considerable system to aspire to. Um, one of the things that we've found with the, with the prairies in this area on a wetland is that often the pH is so low, say Tucker Prairie, pH can be from four to six, you know, depending on where you go, that that will um, um, lower the soil health assessment on, on a site like that. So it's a little bit, um, um, you know, deceptive when we do that. But yeah, there, there's some, there, there's quite a bit of work out there where, where they've looked at different uh, soil health measurements on prairie sides. In other crops, well, the one, you know, the one example I showed you was, was the perennial clover, the Kura clover, which is, is not planted much in this, this, this far south, but, but um, some of the studies in Wisconsin, Minnesota, where they use that particular crop, does improve, uh, does show that the soil quality or soil health improves quite a bit with that particular system. Um, you know, other than uh, um, pasture s sites uh, with perennial grasses, uh, there are some soil health assessments, but we haven't done that much of them. Uh, Nadia, I did compare prairie soils for soil physical and uh, microbiological properties with Dr. Kramer and Anderson. You must have seen the changes in uh, CT computer X-ray measured parameters like porosity distribution, pore distribution, length of the pro, and all these. There are very significant differences between prairie and crop, but I don't know anybody in the cropping systems using prairie type grasses for, as cover crops. It, you know, it really comes down to <clears throat> Um, your goal for the cover and if the coal uh, the, the goal is for a rather quick cover uh, and to get it grown in you know in the window between a grain crop then the prairie grasses are really not in any way suitable um, just because they usually take a year or two to get up and get going and get to where you're going to get much cover out of them so um, I think maybe that's you know one of the reasons why you don't see it used in a cover crop sense Sure, in agroforestry or buffer strips and those kind of things. Sure. Oh. Oh well, uh, Nadia asked whether uh, you know how it would be in an agroforestry system, for example. Uh, the, the the other possibility is um, you know the Leopold Center in Iowa is looking at prairie strips combined with uh, row cropping um, as a strip till type uh, situation where uh, runoff can be. Uh, can be limited uh, as well as uh, uh, nutrient accumulation. So there are some uh, innovative ways that, that permanent or perennial crops can be integrated in cropping system. It's just a matter of whether the particular uh, landowner wants to do that kind of thing. Shibu, do you have an idea to say anything? Uh, talking about soil health here, if you use anhydrous ammonia compared to a non, you know, like a liquid type nitrogen or and the second question is what's it do to your soil health and also if you have a low pH and you dump large quantities of lime on what's that going to do does that shock your microbial activity <clears throat> well and how in hydrous ammonia of, of course will um, affect the microbial community for in the short term as a due to its desiccative effects and change in pH um, 
there really hasn't been a whole lot of uh, work looking at different fertilizer sources, I, I don't think, in terms of uh, effects on, on overall soil health. Uh, ob obviously, the ideal would be to have something that is, uh, allows the microbes to mineralize this nitrogen and let it uh, be uh, tran uh, translocated to the plant uh, naturally. But uh, for some of these uh, modern crop varieties that are dependent on inorganic nitrogen, it's kind of tough to, to realize that. Uh, in terms of the uh, calcium, um, you know, if it's um, fairly good grade uh, limestone, I, I can't see why um, uh, uh, lime, uh, calcium added to the soil in that manner would, would, wouldn't actually be a benefit to the soil microbes. Oftentimes, the available calcium content is a little bit lower than we would expect, even though you're adding quite a bit of uh, limestone to adjust pH. So um, uh, some, some organisms will uh, uh, probably um, uh, be shocked by uh, uh, an increase in the pH, but for overall, I, I, you know, it's one of these things that I'm taking a shot in the dark here. I don't think there's going to be that great of an effect. And remember that there are, I don't know, millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of microorganisms in every teaspoon of soil, and it might be bad for a few of them, but if it's not anything too serious, there's still going to be a great diversity of them that are going to thrive uh, under that new environment, whether it's, you know, that lime added or the, um, the changed pH near our anhydrous band. What would be a realistic estimation of building your soil organic matter looking at the years? Because I've been to a lot of different talks and um, on the soil science side of me, I hear like three years to change your soil organic matter by 1% and I'm just, I don't buy that. So. <laughs> well, it, it no, it is a long term. Um, you know, I, I I was hoping that graphic would would illustrate that. You know, ten ten years of of continuous sampling, or at least annual sampling, we'll put it that way, and we see an increase of about a percent, maybe a percent and a half, and that's in a pretty good soil. These uh, less uh, soils in the Missouri River Hills, uh, other soils that maybe take a little bit longer. So, um, you know, I think it's a matter of of you know, the, the type of uh, cropping system or, or, or uh, plant system that you're using. Uh, one of the things we didn't mention is the integration of livestock. In fact, the, the one uh, uh, a graph there that, sh that we show the high soil uh, health index <clears throat> from, the, from the cover cropping also had, uh, had sheep grazing on it. And uh, so that, that may stimulate more uh, root growth and organic matter or organic carbon release. Uh, I think, you know, you, you need to look at your system and how, how that can be adjusted to get the uh, uh, maximum or most acceptable uh, increase in your soil organic matter. What, one of the things I think why you see a lot of different numbers relative to that really has to do with um, a methodology issue and that some people will go out there and they'll measure just that top centimeter or two of the soil. And that's, that's where you're going to see that most quickly, uh, uh, that soil is most quickly going to increase in your organic matter. And you can see significant increases in it two or three years. Um, and, and that boundary with the surface relative to some of the quality health type things that you're, want, you're interested in is going to be the most important. Uh, relative to that, that uh, for example, aggregate stability and, and infiltration, that, that, that interface right there with the, um, the surface. <clears throat> but if you start sampling deeper, the storage is going to be much slower, and so if you look at it that way, it's going to take a lot longer. And so I think that's probably part of the reason why you see a lot of different numbers thrown out there, and so you have to kind of put it in context at the methodology, I see. It's a very good question. I'm going to throw something in real quick too, which is um, you got two million pounds on top six inches. So if that's in a six-inch sample, you're looking at a twenty-thousand-pound increase. That's ten tons. 
you can sometimes get 10 tons of biomass in a year, um, but a lot of it's going to go off as carbon dioxide. And talking to a modeler, they said average, you figure 6% of it will go to stable carbon. So that would mean it takes 16 years of adding 10 tons to increase at 1%. But it depends on the weather and, you know, the hotter and warmer it is, the more of it's going to go off as carbon dioxide. Well, so we, oh. Rob is uh, making motions that it's lunchtime. Does that mean no more questions or one more? I have one more, a real quick one. It <laughs> has to be a quick answer, too. So when we go out and talk to farmers and recommend soil sampling for soil health analysis, should we be telling them to test the six inches or the two inches? I, I would go with the uh, six inch depth or four. <laughs>